So we're here today with Dr. Michael Hollick, and Dr. Michael Hollick is a expert in the vitamin D world, and he has a PhD in biochemistry, and he's a medical doctor and director of many different units at the Boston University Medical Center. He's also the author of a very well-known book called The Vitamin D Solution. So we're really welcome to have Dr. Hollick today here on the Real Mushrooms Practitioner interview series. So welcome, Dr. Hollick. Thank you very much. So I wanted to just ask you, you know, we talked a little bit about your background, but why did you get into medicine? Why did you get into research? I want to hear your sort of, sort of background there. Yeah, so people, all, of course, always ask that question because how would you get involved in vitamin D? And I had no interest in vitamin D. And when I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin, you didn't really have too many choices. Um, and so I was, it was suggested to me to meet Dr. DeLuca, who was doing vitamin D research and happened to be in the right place at the right time, it turns out, because I was the one as a graduate student that identified the major circulating form of vitamin D, known as 25-hydroxy vitamin D. I was the first with my team um, to identify the active form of vitamin D, 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, three. And also I participated with my roommate in the first chemical synthesis of it that was used to treat bone disease and kidney failure patients. So that was my introduction into translational research. I was always interested in getting a medical degree. So after getting my PhD, I got my master's in three months um, of research, basically. I got my uh, PhD a year later um, and then went to medical school full-time, was a full-time postdoc continuing to do research in vitamin D. So I've had a, a real deep desire to understand vitamin D and all its um, forms and variety. And I have a very special interest in understanding how you make vitamin D in your skin, how is it utilized by your body, what are all the biologic effects of vitamin D? Yeah, that sounds like a really unique sort of trajectory in your career path there. What originally got you into wanting to be a medical doctor? So I always knew, basically, you know, how, how sometimes, you know, even as a young child, I knew when, by the time I was in sixth grade, I would go to my counselor and they said, so, Michael, what would you like to be, right? Like a cowboy or a, a policeman? No, no, no. I wanted to be a physician scientist. That's wonderful. And, so, and, and they told me, so when I would tell my guidance, guidance counselor, is this what I wanted to do? They said, do you realize? That if for you to get a PhD and an MD, that you would probably be 33 years old before you even begin your career. And I said, yeah. And that's exactly how long it took. And it sounds like you're okay with it now. So I'm going to ask you a few questions on the different types of vitamin D. So we know that the type that we get from the sun is um, created via the UVB lights with cholesterol in our skin. And then we can supplement with vitamin D3. And we also know that there's certain foods like medicinal mushrooms, um, different things that can store or sorry, that have vitamin D2. So can you tell me why you'd want to use D3? Maybe maybe why D2 is important or if, it, if you think that's important. Let me know your opinion on the differences between the different forms of vitamins. Sure. So first of all, uh, it's a misconception that people have about cholesterol on your skin. So it's the precursor of cholesterol, 70 hydrocholesterol that absorbs ultraviolet B radiation in the sun, making pre-vitamin D, which then thermally isomerizes the vitamin D in your skin. And so it turns out that um, most vertebrates ex are exposed to sunlight. They make vitamin D3, right? And it turns out that the first vitamin that was discovered was vitamin D2, and that was back in the 1930s when they started irradiating yeast and finding anti-rachitic activity, which was really important because back at, at the turn of the last century in around um, the early 1900s, upwards of 80 to 90 percent of children throughout Europe and uh, northern, uh, eastern, northeastern United States had evidence of rickets. And so the concept of initially adding ergosterol, the precursor uh, that's found in yeast to milk and irradiating it to give it antirachidic activity, ultimately irradiating yeast and making vitamin D2, that that was a major breakthrough in um, helping 
to maintain good bone health in children and prevent rickets. So vitamin D2 had been used uh, for more than 50 years as the major vitamin D supplement. And then some publications came out to imply that maybe vitamin D2 is not as effective, but more importantly, there was a suggestion that if you ingested vitamin D2, it actually increased the destruction of vitamin D3 and therefore could potentially make you more vitamin D deficient. Well, when I read these publications, I had no reason to doubt them, but I decided to do our own research. So we've done now at least three studies looking at vitamin D2 and the maintenance of um, vitamin D status. In the United States, the only pharmaceutical form of vitamin D is vitamin D2 because it predated the FDA. There is no pharmaceutical form of vitamin D3. Lots of supplements, but no pharmaceutical. So when we treat our patients, at least my patients, I give them 50,000 units of vitamin D2, and I give it once a week for eight weeks to fill up the empty vitamin D tank. And then I put them on 50,000 units every two weeks forever to prevent recurrence of vitamin D deficiency. So you can also do the same thing with 50,000 units of vitamin D3 as a supplement. But in my opinion, the supplement, you have no idea who the manufacturer is. You don't know what the quality is. But for the pharmaceutical, we do know. And so um, that's the reason I use it in my clinic. We've done studies and showed if you give the physiologic doses of vitamin D2 and vitamin D3, you will raise the blood levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D to the same degree. But more importantly, the question that should be asked, do your kidneys recognize then 25-hydroxy vitamin D2 as efficiently? And the answer is yes. We did the study and we showed that when you put a person on vitamin D2, it's the major substrate. And so as a result, it's converted to 25-hydroxy vitamin D2, goes to the kidney, and it's converted to 125-dihydroxy vitamin D2. And what we found was that, as you would have anticipated, is that the 125-D3 levels go down, the 125-D2 levels go up, so the total amount remains the same. So whether you're on vitamin D2 or vitamin D3, you can maintain vitamin D status and the active form of vitamin D. So from my perspective, vitamin D2 is as effective as vitamin D3, and I use it all the time in my clinic. Also, vegans are not interested in taking vitamin D3 because it comes from an animal source, which is lanolin. And what they do is that they extract the cholesterol out of lanolin, and then they make it into 7-D hydrocholesterol chemically, and then irradiate it to make vitamin D3. And so you may be aware in India, right, where vegans are, are is very popular, right, is that they recognize vitamin D deficiency as a major health issue. So what is their recommendation? Is to fortify both cooking oil and milk with vitamin D2. That's fascinating. That's that's a really good string of wisdom you just let us in on there in terms of how, yeah, the D2 can be as effective in maintaining vitamin or active status of blood levels of uh, vitamin D. Um, what about, people are always talking about things to maybe optimize vitamin D. We know like you want to, we have to get out in the sun at a certain angle at a certain time of the day in a certain season, but are there any things, say in the winter or even in the summer that optimize the way that vitamin D functions in the body, like different cofactors, different minerals. Is there anything that you have found in your research to suggest that there's any cofactors with that process? Well, a couple of thoughts. The first is, how do you know um, when to go out into the sun to make vitamin D? So time of day, season, latitude, degree of skin pigmentation. You being up in Ontario, for example, six months of the year we showed you basically can't make any at all. And so the best way, of course, to, to deal with that is to develop an app. And so we've developed an app with Ontometrics called D-Minder, D-M-I-N-D-E-R dot I-N-F-O. It'll tell you anywhere on this planet when you can make it, how much you make, and it warns you to get out of the sun so you don't get a sunburn. Okay. And so I also am always asked the question, so it... I always recommend taking a vitamin D supplement. I personally take 5,000 units every day. I'm sorry, 6,000 units every day. 
to 5,000 unit tablet plus a multivitamin containing 1,000 units. My blood level is about 70 nanograms per ml. And so the question, of course, is that I like to, uh, in the summertime, I garden and cycle, and I wear sunscreen on my face, but not on my arms and legs, so I make vitamin D. So do I need to stop the supplement? And the answer is no. I tell pa my patient, because you can't remember when to stop and when to start. So I always stay on 6,000 units every day and get additional sun exposure in the summertime and maybe raise my blood level by a little bit more. You basically no longer can get enough vitamin D from sun exposure. It's because our hunter-gatherers outside every day, right, uh, exposed to sunlight, they were the ones able to do that. We don't do that anymore. Unless you're a lifeguard, right, or a sun worshiper, you cannot get enough. So I always recommend vitamin D supplementation along with sensible sun exposure because the sun exposure makes you feel better. And it has a lot of other biologic effects independent of producing vitamin D. Right. That's where the whole endorphin opiate kind of mechanism sneaks in and highlights. And also nitric oxide, right, right. Which, which helps to lower blood pressure, makes you feel uh, more relaxed and at ease. Yeah. So what about the circadian rhythm, clock genes, and sort of, you know, getting in tune with the sunset and the sunrise. Is there any science to that? Is there any benefit to that? Why don't you take us through the whole circadian rhythm? Right. So there's two things going on. Um, the first is that your major clock is regulated by direct sunlight um, going through the eyes and hitting your pineal gland and regulating melatonin. And so at night, the melatonin level goes up and you feel like you want to go to sleep. And then when the sun rises and, and the duration and intensity of sunlight in your eyes will shut down melatonin. So now you're awake and you feel great. But in the wintertime, we're, as, we're going from, from summer to fall. When that intensity starts to decline, at least in the United States, about 40% of people cannot any, re, any longer regulate their melatonin because the intensity and duration is inadequate. So People get up in the morning, their melatonin levels are still too high, and they feel tired. They want to go back to sleep. And so that's called seasonal effect disorder. And the way to treat it is bright light therapy, 10,000 lux. You just turn the light on in the morning, um, like having your breakfast. You don't have to look at it. It's just that indirect, intense light will help to suppress your melatonin levels, and people feel better. And usually a half an hour to an hour in the morning is perfect. But there's separate um, clock in your cells, um, and that there are what are called transcription factors that regulate cellular activity and, and regulate, therefore, your clock activity. In fact, you have what's called the period gene and the clock gene, and uh, they play a role. And we showed several years ago, and others have done this as well, is that ultraviolet B and A radiation, at least in your skin, can regulate these clock genes. And what's also interesting is that, and you don't really think about this, is that ultraviolet radiation, which is uh, high energy, most of it's absorbed in your epidermis. But visible radiation is not. And so all of the visible radiation is actually penetrating into your body cavity. And there is evidence that um, red light, for example, these red LEDs, can stimulate hair growth, right? That's why they have on the market the, the, L, the red LED uh, kind of hairbrush, right? It's the, and, and blue LEDs, they're used in wound healing and stimulating collagen synthesis in your skin. So there's all kinds of other activities that are going on um, regarding exposure to radiation, sunlight in particular, um, and its biologic effects. Uh, it's super fascinating that we're sort of coming full circle when they used to have the old heliotherapy treatment centers and sunlight clinics in Europe and all over the world. So it's, yeah, it's fascinating to know about that new infrared yeah. research. And, yeah, it was called heliotherapy. Yeah. So looking at vitamin D as well, what about mushrooms? Are you a fan of mushrooms? Do you eat mushrooms? What do you think? Do you think they're a good source of vitamin D too when they've been irradiated by UVB? What's your take on Medicinal mushrooms. Right. Well, we did the study um, and we showed 
that um, that if you take the the mushroom powder that contains vitamin D two, that that vitamin D two is bioavailable, and raises the blood levels to basically the same degree as, as taking the same amount of vitamin D three. So we did a study with two thousand units of vitamin D two in mushrooms, and compared it to taking a supplement of vitamin D three and and vitamin D two as a supplement, and to show that the vitamin D2 in mushrooms is bioavailable and is perfectly fine. And so I think that it is a nice additional um, dietary source of vitamin D. It's quite unique in, in the produce section. It's the only place that you could find potentially vitamin D2. The problem is that people think that because they go on the internet and they hear that mushrooms contain vitamin D2, they assume that all mushrooms do, but they don't. Right, it's only mushrooms that have been exposed to ultraviolet uh, light, right? That they contain vitamin D two, and it says it specifically on the package, right? And I also tell my patients sometimes, for those that wish to do this, is to put your mushrooms in the summertime outside, mm -hmm. right? Because sun dried mushrooms have a high content of vitamin D two, and I suspect that in um, Asian culture where sun-dried mushrooms is a major component of, of their diet, that that's probably where they're getting their major source of vitamin D. Yeah, that's amazing to think of how the sun can infuse the solar goodness into the, the medicinal mushrooms. So what about your own sort of take on your own principles of health? Do you have anything you, you do that you, you, know, you, you, you have as a foundation to sort of keep yourself healthy, you know, doing all your research, all your patients, you got to be doing something to keep so you know bright and active in the research field. So what are you doing for yourself to keep yourself well? Yeah, so I just celebrated my 75th birthday wow. a couple of weeks ago. Yes. Yeah, so um, exercise, um, a good healthy diet, right? Sensible sun exposure, um, and like I said, I take 6,000 units of vitamin D a day, um, and and remain very active. Just the the basics, eh? I like it. Yep. When doing all your research, is there some like old researchers or old books or something that's really sort of gotten your interest or stimulated you in some way? Was there any sort of person or book? I don't I don't know what I'm trying to say, but is there any um yeah, yes. within, within all your research, yeah, tell me about that. Well, I mean, uh, uh Finson, of course, got the Nobel Prize, right? For the use of light in treating uh, skin tuberculosis, right? And so he kind of helped to introduce um, heliotherapy, right? Um, Dr. Sniadecki, who is a Polish physician back in the early 1800s, right? He actually was a scientist physician, and he had a great insight into the fact that children living in Warsaw had a high incidence of rickets, but children living in the rural areas in the farm country did not. He had suggested back in the early 1800s that inadequate sun exposure is responsible for causing the um, pandemic, basically, of rickets, right? And, and I joke about it, but it's true, right? So who's gonna believe a Polish physician in 1822, right? And it would take 100 years before that observation was fully appreciated. And so another physician that I, I read his books is Dr. Hess, Alfred Hess. And he and Dr. Unger um, in New York City showed that if you took children with rickets, put them on a roof uh, of their hospital and expose them to sunlight, they demonstrated marked radiologic improvement in the rickets within six weeks. And that, and that was, um, then the introduction um, by others um, in Europe to show that exposure to ultraviolet B radiation was very effective. So yeah, I've done, a, I've collected a lot of the older uh, publications, um, giving insight into what they were thinking about um, as it relates to sunlight, health, and vitamin D. Excellent. Yeah, those sound like some really unique thought leaders uh, ahead of their time, like you said. Couple more questions just before we wrap up. I want to be mindful of your time. So, 
when looking at the D3 supplements or the D2, do you, do you think that there's a conversion factor in the kidneys, like you said, or in the skin that some people, is that genetic, do you think? Or why do you think some people maybe convert it better other than maybe the melanin level in their skin? Is there genetics there? Is there kidney function stuff going on? What do you think? Right. So um, there are some of my patients that are on the same dose of vitamin D to have much higher blood levels. And the reason we think is that the body is not stupid. And so this act of vitamin D, uh, which is 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, either D2 or D3, it is so potent that the body instantly increases the mechanism for its destruction. So it goes into the cell, it interacts with the nucleus, it causes a biologic response, but at the same time induces its own destruction. Because if you don't do that and went back outside and came back in again, potentially would cause toxicity. And, that, and that's an enzyme called the 24-hydroxylase. And so, and it's the 24-hydroxylase in your kidney in particular that probably is regulating your total blood levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And so I have a couple of patients that have a deficiency in the 24-hydroxylase. And so as a result, they can maintain their blood levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D and 125-dihydroxy vitamin D without taking essentially any vitamin D. Fascinating. That's interesting. Thank you for sharing that. So, Dr. Hollick, where can people find your work? Where do you want to um, direct them in terms of your website? Where are you hanging out these days? Sure. So just drholic.com okay. is, is perfect. And then, like I said, go to the app, dminder.info. Okay, great. And that's and the, it's free on your iPhone and Android. And that's dminder, D-M-I-N-D-R, right? No, uh, M-I-N-D-E-R. D-E-R, sorry, dminder. Yeah. Okay. dminder.info. Okay. Vitamin D reminder. Okay, I got it here. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, we really appreciate you having you on the Real Mushrooms Practitioner Interview Series, and thank you for sharing your wisdom and insight into the vitamin D picture. My pleasure. Have a delightful day.